Tales have been told since man first gathered around the fires of prehistory. Tales of the strange and wondrous things hidden in the vast unknown shadows of the world. Tales of creatures divine and beasts demonic, of gods and kings, of myths and monsters. From dark forests to the lands of ice, from desert wastes to the storm-thrashed seas, every corner of the earth has its legends to tell. Stories of heroes and the villains they encounter, of the wilderness and the dangers within, Stories of battles, of love, of order, and of chaos. But what are the roots of these fantastic tales? And why have they endured so long? In this series, we'll explore the history behind these legends and reveal the hidden influences that shaped them. War and disease, religious and social upheaval, the untamable ferocity of the natural world. And above all, the monsters lurking within ourselves. Ivan was alone in the castle. His wife, the fair and fierce princess, had gone to war with her armies. She had left Ivan just one instruction. He was not to climb the tallest turret of the tallest tower. Weeks passed and Ivan grew bored. He remembered his wife's command, but his curiosity conquered all. Ivan climbed the tallest turret of the tallest tower. At the top, he found a chamber, and within, a starving prisoner. Please, water. Ivan was moved by the sight and fetched a cup of water. The prisoner drank it all, but then he suddenly transformed. For the prisoner was none other than the dreaded Koshay the Deathless. You fool, he cried. Now you will never see your wife again. With that, he bounded through the open window and swept like a whirlwind into the sky. And soon, he would have the princess in his grasp. If he was ever to rescue his beloved wife, a long and dangerous adventure lay ahead. Ivan's quest had begun. The story of Ivan and Koshe the Deathless is an old Slavic tale. But all human beings are storytellers. Throughout history and across civilizations, humans have told one another stories. Stories of good and evil, of great deeds and lost causes. Stories of our past, our futures, and who we are now. Stories are a way we explore what it means to be human. We live today in a culture saturated with narrative and story. But in the days before mass media, the internet, film camera, even the printing press, the need for story was no less. When the ability to read and write was given to very few, tales were spread by word of mouth. With each telling, a detail here might change or something there might be forgotten and replaced with something new. And in this process of mutation, these stories became something else. Something not stemming from one mind or one pen, but something instead that was the product of a collective, of a particular people at a particular place and time they became myth. Myths tell us who we are. We use stories to explain to ourselves why we do things in certain ways. They tell us about the part of ourselves that's emotion, that's not entirely rational.
things can happen in myths on a much grander scale. Emotions are heightened, drama is heightened. Myths tell us an awful lot about our desire for justice, the desire for truth, the desire for different sorts of virtues, and about how and why we go on journeys and what we actually do on the journey in order to return home. It tells us what our values are. It tells us how we treat strangers, how we treat our family, how we worship the gods, what happens if we don't. They are embedded in our cultural psyche, whether we realise it or not. Few myths are more exciting than tales of great heroes and the foes they encounter in their adventures. Such heroic quests are found in tales from cultures across the globe and throughout history. But there are often striking similarities between such stories. The mighty warrior who is all but invulnerable to harm. The witches and wizards who help or hinder. The menacing giants the beguiling temptations, the journeys into dark caves or into the depths of the underworld, all are found in tales from different cultures and different times. But what if there was more to these echoes than mere coincidence? That was the belief of an American mythologist named Joseph Campbell. From an early age, Campbell was obsessed with mythology. As a young man in the 1930s, he spent years examining ancient texts from around the world. It was in this period of intense study that a theory formed in his mind. It was a theory that would make him famous. In the countless stories that he read and analyzed, Campbell thought he spotted something, a pattern. Campbell was trying to make a claim for a sort of universal human nature that can be appealed to by a certain kind of story. He laid out what he thought was the story that's common to all hero myths everywhere in the world. Campbell believed that you could read this kind of mythological quest or the hero's journey throughout all of Western mythology. As he engages with non-Western cultures, he develops this idea further until we get the book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces. The Hero with a Thousand Faces was published in 1949, drawing on the pioneering works of Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung and others. Campbell outlined the recurring stages he had identified in story after story, from culture after culture. He dubbed it the Hero's Journey. The Hero with a Thousand Faces became an unlikely bestseller, with a particular impact on the big screen. George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars, has credited the book with shaping his thoughts about the saga. And Luke's thrilling adventures follow almost every stage laid out by the hero's journey. All hero's journeys begin with the hero at rest in their home culture. So one particular stage is the call to adventure. An outsider figure comes and calls them to adventure, says, come on, Luke, you've got to go do something now and help this girl. He embarks on a journey into the unknown, a realm that's usually much more crowded with the supernatural. The hero is tested in these strange surroundings and has to pass various trials in order to continue. Within that realm, he meets various mentors and also various companion figures who become part of a sort of entourage that he travels around with. Typically, he then has a near-death experience type adventure where he plunges down into some kind of abyss. But the hero survives this darkest moment and then achieves perhaps new knowledge or a treasure as a reward. And then he flees, pursued by the enemy from which he arises transformed, capable of fulfilling the quest on which he started out. There's one final test, and that is often a moment of life or death. And the hero has to use all the knowledge that he's gained up until this far to come through that and succeed. The end result is a new world, a new status quo that comes into being. The Hero with the Thousand Faces 
became one of the most influential books in the 20th century. But how did Campbell's ideas apply away from the cinema screen? Does Ivan's battle with Koshe the Deathless fit the model? What about the other great adventures of mythology? Is every hero truly on the same journey? Or is Joseph Campbell's theory just another myth? We begin with Arthur, legendary king of the Britons, and the tale of the greatest quest his knights embarked upon, the quest for the Holy Grail. Stories of King Arthur have been told and retold for centuries. The legendary monarch was raised in obscurity far from court, but he proved his birthright by drawing the sword from the stone. And from his castle at Camelot, he went on to rule Britain with wisdom and justice. King Arthur for us is a mythical figure, possibly based on a real life figure from the sixth or eighth century. The very earliest reference to Arthur is in a 7th century Welsh poem. It's quite a fun one, where a great warrior is described and then it adds sort of ruefully, but he wasn't Arthur. It's that he seems just to be known as a warrior. He's not really being referenced as a king. But in the 11th century, a guy called Geoffrey of Monmouth, obviously also from Wales, produces the first really sustained narrative about Arthur and the Round Table. The history of the kings of Britain is a pseudo-historical account of British history, chronicling the lives of its kings over the course of 2,000 years, until the Anglo-Saxons assumed control of much of the island around the 7th century. The problem with the history of Britain is that it's not completely factual. It's a real patchwork of various historical facts, certainly some fiction mixed in, so it's a real melting pot of influences that Geoffrey Monmouth puts into the history of Britain. The Arthur of mythology and the wonderful Towers of Camelot stand very much, I think, for a, a vision of Britain that never existed, but perhaps one that a lot of people wish did exist. It has all the hallmarks of the great epic, boy born in obscurity, magical figures, battles, it has knights, it has romance, it has tragedy as well, of course, and then it has this notion at the end that the king will return. That, I think, is comforting on some level, that in England's greatest need, this epic warrior will return. So whatever you think a perfect king is, that's Arthur. What he's become is a British personification of the ideal king. And therefore that varies across different periods because people's idea of what they want from a king and what they want from a leader is historically quite variable. Arthur was a great king, but even great kings sometimes need help. So too would Ivan in his quest to defeat Koshe the Deathless. Ivan journeyed on through forests and valleys, until one day he came upon a wondrous palace hidden among the trees. As he neared its gates, he was watched from the branch of a lofty oak tree. For this was the home of the falcon wizard. Ivan explained his quest to him. The wizard knew of Koshe and the danger Ivan faced. He promised help if ever it was needed. Ivan continued on his quest. In the days that followed, he met an eagle wizard, then a raven wizard too. Both made the same promise to Ivan. He would need all their help to succeed in his quest and rescue the lost princess. Heroes cannot do it all alone. Sometimes they will have to rely on the wisdom and aid of others to triumph. And sometimes these Helpers are in disguise, sometimes they possess magical powers, and sometimes they go on to become as famous as the heroes themselves. At 
King Arthur's side through many of the stories is a mysterious figure with magical powers, the wizard known as Merlin. He was the one who planted the sword in the stone, and it was he who brought Arthur from obscurity to claim the British crown. In popular culture today, Merlin is as renowned as Arthur himself. He is the archetypal wizard, the ancestor and inspiration for Gandalf in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and Obi-Wan Kenobi in the Star Wars films. But magical helpers such as Merlin are found throughout myth and legend. Joseph Campbell recognized this. The supernatural aid is usually an older character. Their wisdom and guidance are needed for the adventure ahead. Often, too, they must give the hero the final push necessary to leave the ordinary behind and enter the special world. King Arthur and the wizard Merlin were once thought real historical figures. Over time, such beliefs faded. However, the stories themselves never went away. The development of the legend in the medieval era culminated in 1485. That year saw the publication of Le Mort d'Arthur, The Death of Arthur. Eight stories of the king and his knights, compiled from sources in France and in England. Here was the Arthurian legend complete. The author of the book was a man named Sir Thomas Mallory. Historical documentation tells us Thomas Mallory was a thief, a brigand, perhaps even a sexual predator and a rapist, and that ultimately he was incarcerated in Newgate Prison in London. We tend to associate the Mort d'Arthur with chivalry and with a particular interest in the Knights of the Round Table as defenders of women. So at first we might go, well, wait, why would a rapist write that? It's this criminal aspect which has made critics wary of suggesting that this is the Mallory who writes Mort d'Arthur because they see a clear disconnection between his criminal behaviour and a text that seems to be about chivalry. The Arthurian legends may have roots in more ancient folklore, but Mallory's work is distinctly Christian. Religious symbolism saturates the text, and supernatural elements common in earlier versions are all but eliminated. In Mallory's Christian Camelot, there is little room for the wizard Merlin and the pagan magic he represents. Even Arthur himself seems tainted by the association. For the holiest and most famous adventure of Le Mort d'Arthur centers neither on Merlin nor on the king he mentored. Instead, it is the Knights of Camelot who embark on this great adventure, the quest for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail in most mythologies is the cup Jesus Christ used at the Last Supper, in which he consecrated the wine and turned it into his blood. Later in legend, Joseph of Arimathea is supposed to have come along with this same cup and caught the blood from the wound in Christ's side. That cup then will give immortality to those who then drink from it. Of course, immortality not just in the physical sense, but much more in the spiritual sense. It becomes this holy relic with this really heightened significance where it becomes something to be possessed at all costs, but something which only a few people can actually approach. The knights were called to adventure in the most direct way. During a dinner at Camelot, the castle shook and a holy light filled the chamber. Then, the grail itself appeared before Arthur and his knights. After the miraculous appearance of the Grail at Camelot, the knights Lancelot, Galahad, Percival and Bors set out to retrieve it. Arthur mourned their departure. He knew the quest his knights embarked upon would change them forever and that the fellowship with Camelot would never be the same. His knights left the ordinary world of the castle behind. Crossing the threshold, they entered the special world of adventure. Ivan had found his captive wife at last, but the demon holding her was too fast. 
dry as he might, Ivan could never catch them. Koshe the Deathless had a magical steed whose legs outpaced the wind. The exhausted Ivan finally gave up the chase. It was then that Koshe attacked. Ivan was no match for the strength of the giant. Koshe chopped him into pieces, bound him in a barrel, and pitched him into the sea. Far away, Ivan's wizard friends sensed his plight. They rescued the barrel and put Ivan back together again. He could never outpace Koshe, they said, not without a magical horse, and those could only be found beyond thrice nine lands and a river of fire at the home of the Baba Yaga. His quest was far from over, but at last he knew how he could save his beloved wife and defeat the demonic giant. For a hero like Ivan to succeed, he must overcome a series of often dangerous tests. Joseph Campbell called this stage the Road of Trials. Here, these perilous, for an audience, exciting encounters challenge the hero, who is often aided by magical helpers or thwarted by new enemies. But with every victory and setback, our hero is learning and preparing for greater tests to come. No road of trials was longer or more arduous than that faced by the hero of the ancient Greek epic, the Odyssey. Attributed to an author known only by the name Homer, it tells the story of the journey home of Odysseus after the Trojan War. He had been fighting at Troy with his fellow Greek kings for 10 years. Meanwhile, on his home island of Ithaca, the son he had left behind was growing up without him. Other men were eyeing his empty throne and Penelope, his unaccompanied wife. Odysseus was the king of Ithaca, and he was known as being a very important hero during the Trojan War. He was the person who came up with the plot to get inside the walls of Troy with the Trojan horse, and was mainly known for his intellectual skill. Odysseus is best described by Homer's opening line on him, the man of many minds, the man with the really rich inventive brain. Odysseus was at war for a decade. Getting home, however, would take just as long. Such an extended journey was not Odysseus' intention, of course. He had planned to sail straight back home across the sea to join his wife and son in Ithaca. But as was often the case in the tales of ancient Greece, the plans of mortal men were at the mercy of unpredictable and often vengeful gods. The Greeks have managed to alienate some very powerful deities by their incessant pursuit of Troy. And as a result of that, they've particularly angered the god Poseidon. And the god Poseidon pretty much ensures that Odysseus and his men aren't going to have a straightforward journey back to Ithaca. One of the people he met on his journey was the Cyclops Polyphemus. And this is where the trouble starts. He and his men are captured by the Cyclops, who's a big, scary giant with one eye in the middle of his forehead. He starts eating Odysseus's men one by one and eventually lets them go by mistake because Odysseus tricks him. But then it turns out that the Cyclops is the son of Poseidon. Poseidon essentially is very offended at the outrage that's been done to his son and dogs Odysseus's steps all the way home. Odysseus' journey became a lot more difficult. On his road of trials, he encountered hideous monsters, ravenous cannibals, a deceitful witch, together with all the wild and strange furies of the sea, among them, of course, the beguiling but deadly sirens. 
These mysterious creatures lived in a meadow on a tiny island. Singing out to the ships that passed, they lured countless men to their shores, never to leave again. Odysseus knew all this, but wanted to hear their song all the same. He ordered his men to stop up their ears with wax and tie him to the mast. No matter how he pleaded, the men were not to release him, and they were not to stop rowing. Homer doesn't tell us what the sirens look like. There's no physical description in Homer at all, until you hit some point in the medieval period, where suddenly you start getting many more illustrations of sirens as half woman, half fish. When we think about how it is to live a life that's dominated by the ocean and by voyaging and by the physical apprehension of just how alien the ocean is, we want to put some flesh on that to tell a story about that, to tell a story about our fear and our longing. And to do that, we create something that's part ocean and part us, and that's the mermaid. Mermaids date back to the Assyrian cultures of 1000 BC, but are common to folklore around the world. They are usually depicted as young and beautiful. However much like the sea itself, mermaids can help or hinder. The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen is a story of the kinder sort. Published in 1836, the book tells of a young mermaid who saves a human prince from drowning. Falling in love, she trades her beautiful voice to a sea witch for a potion which transforms her into a human. But winning the prince's heart proves far from easy. Anderson's kind heroine is unlike many other mermaids, however. In British folklore, the creatures brought bad luck and were said to taunt sailors in doomed ships. Slavic mermaids were also dangerous. They were called Rizalkas and were the spirits of the unhappy dead. Beautiful and damned, they lured young men into the waters to drown beside them. Worth remembering at this point that hardly anyone could swim in the pre-industrial world. Therefore, all cultures produce this phenomenon of terrifying emanations that represent death at sea. People tend to imagine sailors loving the sea. Actually, they don't, and all the folklore shows they don't. They distrust it, and they find it terrifying and unpredictable and scary. This is way before we've got electronic navigation. This is in the early days of shipfaring, where you have to stay close to the shore because if you get too far out, you're in trouble. It's well worth remembering how horribly physically impossible long voyages were in the past. So if you were at sea for more than three or four weeks, scurvy would have started to set in. And scurvy affects your mental processes. It makes you hallucinate, makes you see things that aren't there, makes you interpret what you see in frightening hallucinogenic type terms. Could these hallucinations be the cause of such visions of sirens and mermaids? We will never know for sure. Odysseus sailed on unharmed from his encounter with the sirens, but they were far from the only female threat he faced on his journey home. To reach his wife Penelope, Odysseus had to outfox the witch Circe who had transformed his men into pigs. And he had to flee imprisonment by the nymph Calypso, who desired him for her husband. The threat from a lot of the female antagonists that Odysseus encounters is they set up rival places to dwell. The fact it takes him so long to wrench himself away from Circe, the fact he has to endure staying with Calypso, all reinforces just how much that nostos, that return home, is so important. Of course, Penelope is being constantly hounded by different suitors at the court. So I think there's a mirroring effect there, is that when Odysseus is moving through his journey, of course, he's then got to also be assailed by these various women. One thing that scholars have said about the Song of the Sirens is that the language that's used and the way it's phrased in the original Greek 
feels much more like it's been a passage taken out of the Iliad, that in a way the sirens are actually trying to call Odysseus back into the previous poem, <laughs> into being a previous sort of hero, the sort of hero of the battlefield, and that part of his temptation is to go back to that form of heroism, which now the Trojan War has ended, there's no place for anymore. Once a hero such as Odysseus has negotiated the trials, seen off temptations, and survived it all, he is ready for one final ordeal. The object of the quest is within reach. One more challenge lies ahead. The greatest he must endure. Hungry and faint, he walked on and on. Until at last, Ivan came to the house. Twelve poles stood in a circle around it. On all but one was stuck a human head. This was the home of the Baba Yaga. You've come for my horses, said the old woman. Well, you can take one if you're fast enough. I'll give you three days to find them. Fail, though, and I'll put your head on a spike. Ivan had no choice. The Baba Yaga's mares, however, were just as fast as promised. They hid from Ivan in every corner of the woods. It was only with the help of friends made and lessons learned on his quest that Ivan succeeded. At the end of the three days, he left the enraged Baba Yaga on the back of a new steed. Ivan willed the magical creature on towards a reunion with the princess and a final confrontation with Koshe the Deathless. The ordeal is the greatest test of the hero. The risk of failure or even death hangs over them. Ivan survives the ordeal and is rewarded. And in other tales, the hero must slay a minotaur, journey to the underworld, or as in the Icelandic saga of the Volsungs, survive an encounter with a great and terrible dragon. The Volsunga saga dates back over a thousand years. It tells of the rise and fall of the ill-fated Volsung clan, their encounters with the gods, and their triumphs and defeats in love and battle. Volsung saga began as a series of separate tales that told individual high-born families of their associations with the heroic past. The earliest evidence for the saga are from the 7th and 8th century. We know these stories are being told even around the year 1000 because there are runestones in Sweden. The culture of the states that produced Volsung Saga, it's a culture of warriors, it's a culture of voyagers, it's a culture that hugely privileges male adventurousness and male willingness to take enormous risks, and therefore it produces a hero that's also very extreme. This hero was Sigurd, his father had been killed in a battle with the god Odin, so the young Sigurd was raised by a dwarf master blacksmith named Regin. Sigurd is someone that medieval audience could aspire to be like in terms of his humility and his wisdom. He is one of those figures that, like many heroes, connects the gods with the human. But he comes also to represent, very importantly, not only the interface between humans and the gods, but also the interface between human beings and wild nature. As he evolves, he becomes more and more about being a kind of wild man. What would a man be like if he wasn't ever civilized, if he wasn't ever subject to being taught? and brought up and taught codes of manners. The villain facing Sigurd in the Volsunga saga is a creature named Fafnir. 
Fafnir was the brother of the dwarf Brigin, but his lust for gold corrupted him. He murdered his father and stole the family treasure. Obsessively guarding this vast trove deep in the mountains, over time he transformed into a dragon. Dragons are found in stories across the world, from ancient texts of Greece and China to the epics of Persia and later tales of Christianity. But every culture's dragon is different. The Germanic dragon seems to be particularly into treasure. And I think this is an association with the quintessential idea of the good ruler. The best thing a lord can be is generous. So if you want to do a good epithet for a good lord, you call him a ring giver. Obviously, the dragon represents the exact opposite of that. He's keeping all the treasure for himself. Fafnir can be seen to represent um, the worst aspects of greed. He hoards this treasure in a way that it can't be used by anyone. It can't be put to use by a good ruler who would share it among his men and ensure that society functioned well. Sigurd is sent to kill the dragon Fafnir by his foster father, Regin. Near the dragon's lair, Sigurd finds a great trench carved in the earth. For every day, Fafnir is leaving his treasure and slithering down to the river to drink. Sigurd digs a hole in this trench and waits for the dragon. As Fafnir passes above, Sigurd thrusts his sword up into the serpent's belly. Fafnir is defeated, but it is not the treasure alone that Sigurd wins. He tastes some of the dragon's blood, and as soon as the dragon's blood touches his tongue, he can understand the speech of birds. That really just brings to the fore the way that Sigurd is destined to be a part of the wild. It enables him to live in the wild as if it were his society. The reward quickly proves useful. Birds are chattering in the trees above. Sigurd soon realizes that they're talking about him. His foster father, Regin, the birds say, is plotting to betray Sigurd. His adventure is not over yet. Sigurd's story and the Falsunga saga do not end with the defeat of Fafnir, nor does the hero's journey. Once the object of one's quest has been achieved, there is the return home. And coming back can be as adventurous and as dangerous and as thrilling as setting out in the first place. Ivan and the princess raced away from Koshe. The demon, however, was close on their heels. But Ivan would not be defeated this time. Just as Koshe was closing in, Ivan swung his club high and hard. Koshe the Deathless was dead. Ivan's quest was at an end. His beloved wife was safe at last. The giant's body burned on a pyre. As Koshe's ashes scattered to the winds, Ivan and his princess returned on their magical steed to the castle in the woods. There they ruled in peace and happiness forevermore. Successful in returning from the special world, our hero returns not only with the object of his quest, but with the newfound wisdom and self-knowledge required to build a better life. A new status quo is born in the ordinary world. And so the hero's journey comes to an end. Several decades have passed since Campbell first outlined his theory. Storytellers from Hollywood and beyond continue to be inspired by it. 
and it's helped shape modern thinking about the origin of myth. But Campbell is not without his critics. Scholars continue to debate the merits of his theory, and there are many other lenses through which to examine mythology's roots and meaning. All these mythologies were developed by societies for a really wide variety of different purposes, other than simple entertainment. They were often developed to teach people very complex moral lessons about being members of particular cultures. When we're thinking about myths, we do have to look at the particular culture they've grown out of, because they do tell us something about the nationalistic background or the cultural background of these particular indigenous peoples. If you look underneath and pay attention to the cultures themselves and start looking at the context in the broader world they live in, they're just far more interesting. The idea of a common humanity reflected in the hero's journey remains an attractive one in an often divided world. But as this series will show, the realm of myths and monsters is far too strange and fascinating for one model to contain. In the long history of humanity, and in the deep recesses of our collective imaginations, there are far more stories for us to explore. Stories of magic and wonder, of love and betrayal, of sacrifice and cruelty. The world we know, and the great mysteries that lie beyond. The tales have been told since man first gathered around the fires of prehistory. Tales of the strange and wondrous things hidden in the vast unknown shadows of the world. Tales of creatures divine and beasts demonic, of gods and kings, of myths and monsters. From dark forests to the lands of ice, from desert wastes to the storm-thrashed seas, every corner of the earth has its legends to tell. Stories of heroes and the villains they encounter, of the wilderness and the dangers within, Stories of battles, of love, of order, and of chaos. But what are the roots of these fantastic tales? And why have they endured so long? In this series, we'll explore the history behind these legends and reveal the hidden influences that shaped them. War and disease, religious and social upheaval, the untamable ferocity of the natural world. And above all, the monsters lurking within ourselves. The battlefield today belongs to the sniper, the tank, the bomb, the bullet, and we seek ever more inventive means of mutual destruction. But why do we fight? It is a question asked by every culture and by every generation for our world has always been at war. Through the millennia of human existence, we have fought for land and wealth, 
for love and revenge, to liberate and to oppress, to save allies and to punish enemies. We have fought and fought again. War is an intense period of struggle, so it's also therefore an intense period of cultural definition. War allows you to see the ethical priorities of a culture that's created it. How do we cope with people we've captured? What do we do if we lose? Who do we go to war against? Society's stories of war tell us what values they hold dear and that they maintain through warfare. They're a way of incorporating unpredictable forces into a belief system that help people to make sense of things that they couldn't prevent or predict. In a society's representation of war, it represents what it thinks of itself, what its ideals are. It determines what values the culture holds dear. Whether by choice or necessity, war has been a constant in human history and all civilizations have had to grapple with the questions it raises. The stories we tell of war, the justifications we find for violence and the condolences we seek for loss all reveal something about our values as individuals and as societies. The Nemedians had come seeking a new home, but they found in Ireland only misery. For they were enslaved by the Fomorians, cruel ogres renowned for their greed. Chief among these terrors were the two strongest and ugliest ogres, Mork and his brother Conan. The fruit of the Nemedians' labor they seized for themselves. But the Nemedians had not come so far to be slaves forever. One man stood against their foe. Fergus Redside was his name. He was the son of the great hero Nemed himself. He stirred rebellion among the huts and shacks of the Nemedian villagers. No longer would they bear the oppression of Conan and Mork. They wearied of their servitude. They readied themselves for war. The story of the Nemedians and their oppression by the Fomorians is told in the Celtic Book of Invasions. Compiled around the 11th century, the book charts the history of Ireland from creation through to the Middle Ages. It tells the stories of five mythical tribes who invaded Ireland one by one before the final arrival of the Gaelic people and the establishment of a Christian kingdom. Origin stories such as this are common. Almost every civilization thinks it is special and develops a myth of its beginnings to prove it. The bustling heart of modern Italy is today one of the largest cities in Europe. It has been continuously inhabited for more than 3,000 years. And everywhere in the city can be seen the remnants of that long history, relics of an age when the city ruled the world. By the second century, Almost 100 million people lived under Roman rule, a fifth of the world's population at the time. Rome's power stretched from the north of Britain to Egypt in the south, from Spain in the west to the Persian Gulf in the east. The image is famous to this day, a she-wolf suckling two infant boys as if they were her own. These were the twin brothers, Romulus and Remus. Their grandfather, the king, had been usurped and the boys banished from home. 
Thanks to the she-wolf, however, they survived long enough to be found by a shepherd who raised them as his own. Growing up, the twins discovered their birthright and helped their grandfather retake his crown. They then set out to found a city of their own. Each began construction in a different place, and the dispute soon took a violent turn. When Remus mockingly leapt over his brother's budding defenses, Romulus responded with a fatal blow and the words, so perish anyone who attacks my walls. The foundation of Rome rests on fratricide, brother killing brother. It's not a positive place to start your story. Usually you'd expect a single hero who's the foundation of the nation, whereas in this instance we have two competing heroes. It's a very, very weird foundation myth. It takes away from that idea of a single exemplar of the virtues of the civilization that's founded. Indeed, neither Romulus nor Remus is particularly exemplary. Remus because he gets killed, and Romulus because he murders his own brother. The tale troubled and intrigued the Romans, especially as it was regarded not as myth, but as history, and history that could be seen and touched. The Temple of Jupiter Stator by the Forum was said to have been founded by Romulus himself. For centuries, his hut was preserved on the Palatine Hill, and Romans could even visit the cave where the she-wolf was said to have cared for the infant boys. We might expect them to be a bit awkward about this story, but they're not. They tell it again and again and again. Uh, it's recorded in the primary sources. It's recorded as something that is an important part of what it means to be Roman. It was grounded very much in the physical location of Rome, as the whole of the Romulus and Remus myth is. It was very much about the roots these people had in this particular patch of ground, which is why we always talk about the Roman Empire. Despite how far it spreads, we always come back to Rome, to these particular locations that always remain very vividly part of the Roman identity. Some identified in the story the seeds of violence which Rome would later use to conquer the world. Others saw in the deadly struggle between brothers a cruel omen of the civil wars that would split the Roman Empire again and again. Attempts were made by poets and politicians to soften the tale of Romulus and Remus or replace it with other more sanitized accounts of the city's origins. The Romans were very good at understanding that myths and stories had the capability to be told and to be shaped and to be retold and reshaped as you needed to do so. So there were alternative versions told. It's Cicero who actually denies that Romulus kills Remus and actually sort of deletes the part of the myth that probably gave it its purchase on the Roman imagination. The idea that in drinking the milk of a wolf, Romulus and Remus are imbibing a ferocity that Rome has yet fully to contain is in part why Cicero's and Virgil's generation want to forget the whole thing. Plus, they invent a bunch of other much sleeker, much more fit for purpose foundation myths, of which the best known is the one invented by Virgil, the myth of Aeneas. The noble, heroic Aeneas was a refugee from Troy. He led his people across the Mediterranean to Italy, where he founded the city that would one day give rise to the Roman people. His story is told most famously by the poet Virgil in his great epic, The Aeneid. He was writing during a new era in Roman history. Augustus was consolidating his power as the first emperor, and the grander, more dignified origin story offered by the Aeneid seemed fit for the times. But if it was intended to eclipse older stories in the Roman imagination, it would fail. Romulus and Remus would retain their place in the history books of ancient Rome. But of course, it wasn't real history at all. The brothers did not create Rome, Rome created them. It was not the murder of Remus that explained the violence of the Romans. It was the violence of the Romans that lay behind the myth.
Military life goes through all aspects of Roman society. The Roman army is conscript. It's not a volunteer professional force. And that means that you have a very high proportion of people in Rome, broadly speaking, who either will have been in the army or will have relatives who have been in the army. So there's a knowledge and a familiarity with military matters that is very deeply embedded in everyday life and everyday activity. He does one really interesting thing that's very important for Roman ideas of the self and the relation between the individual and the city. And that is, he's killed by Romulus. So the point of the story then becomes, even my brother is less important to me than defending Rome. It's Rome above all. Remus is there to show that Romulus is willing, and all Romans must be willing, to sacrifice familial ties for the city. Perhaps that is why the bloody story of the twins endured. No finer mirror of the city's character could be found. In one act of fraternal bloodshed, the myth taught Romans that the success of their city relied not only on violence, but on sacrifice. Rome was great, but so was the price paid. The Tower of Conand, the great fortress, lay before them. The Nemedians, 30,000 of them, had come to claim their freedom. These men were farmers, not soldiers, but they would fight all the same. For they were led by a brave and mighty warrior, Fergus Redside, the son of Nemeth. From the high tower, Conan watched them gather with an outraged snarl. The impudence of these slaves. Massed on the plain below, the Nemedian army grew larger and larger. Hammer and pike, scythe and spear, they held their weapons aloft and roared in time to the beat of the drum. The great ogre was readied. Armor was strapped to his body. The men raised their swords. The drums grew louder. The battle was about to begin. Despite war's constant presence in history, few of us are natural soldiers. Killing other people runs against the instincts of most, and sheer terror on the battlefield paralyzes many more. It's no surprise, then, that throughout history we find enemies dehumanized and the glory of a heroic death magnified. The sentiments are found in the words of politicians and poets, in the works of sculptors and painters, and in the stories and myths that cultures held dear. The frozen north is no place for the faint-hearted. Its winters are long and dark. It is a land of sheer cliffs and deep fjords, of rock and ice. To live in such a place is to battle against the elements, and such extremes of nature perhaps produce extremes of man. The Norse lived in Scandinavia between the 8th and 11th centuries. It was a society that extolled war and battle, whose daring warriors crossed continents in search of glory. What lay behind their success was a mastery of sailing. In 793, the Norse launched a raid on Lindisfarne, a sacred island off the northeast coast of England. The monastery there was looted and its inhabitants slaughtered. The age of the Vikings had begun. The attack on Lindisfarne stunned Christian Europe. One contemporary wrote, never before has such a terror appeared in Britain as we have now suffered from a pagan race. I think there were two quite important factors about the Norse that made them appear genuinely shocking. 
and that was that they arrived in boats. They struck somewhere quickly and they moved on and there was no way of knowing where they would go next. And also there's the whole culture clash. You can't say that the Vikings and the Norse ever raided because they were thinking about religious differences, but from the point of view of the Anglo-Saxons, those religious differences mattered a lot. Stories of the brave and barbarous Vikings spread quickly. Most feared among their warriors were the berserkers. These shock troops fought in a trance-like fury and seemed to experience no pain or fear. But if this was a culture that glorified war, then all parts of Norse society, women included, played a role. Girls were often given warlike names. Gunnhild, for instance, was a popular choice and literally meant war battle. In time, of course, they were expected to raise strong future warriors themselves. And any deformed babies were to be abandoned in the elements to die. One thing they did not do was fight. They were not trained as warriors, as men were. According to mythology, however, there was still a female presence on the battlefield, and they had the most important job of all. The Valkyries are immortal warrior maidens whose job it is to decide which warriors get to fall in battle. They were then tasked with taking the souls of the dead warriors to Valhalla, which is in effect the afterlife presided over by the god Odin. You might think of Valhalla as similar to the way in which knights going on crusade were told that their sins would be pardoned if they died in a crusade. It sweetens the deal a bit, it knocks the edges off the fear of telling them that if they die in battle, they're going to live a lovely life where they're given mead all the time and they just have to fight each day for Odin and then they're resurrected and they go back to feasting. It makes the idea of dying in battle seem less terrible. The promise of Valhalla must have offered comfort to the fearful before battle and solace to those grieving afterwards. Death on the battlefield was recast as a mirror of birth and just as it was women who once brought men into the world, so it was females who carried them into the next. The gender of the Valkyries is often bound up in the roles that they perform in the myths. So in Valhalla, when they're bringing the mead cup round to the warriors. This is very much the role of the noble woman in society as well. It's what the hostess would do at a great feast or a gathering in a king or a lord's hall. Fate figures are nearly always female in all European mythologies. There is an unbelievably creepy Valkyrie moment in Njal's saga, where you actually see the Valkyries weaving with men's intestines and using men's severed skulls as weights. Instead of the tools of the trade, they have a shuttle that is a spearhead, and they beat the wall with a sword rather than the standard wooden tool that they'd use. Weaving is normally a virtuous thing for householders to do, but these women are weaving with guts and heads. So they're doing something that's on the one hand really uber feminine, but on the other hand is a creepy inverted version of it. Stories of war and the Valkyries are found throughout Norse mythology. The gods constantly fought amongst themselves and against their rivals, the giant and monstrous Jutnar. But were the Norse as belligerent a people as we often think? Is their reputation for violent banditry, which remains to this day, a fair one? Were they all Vikings? There's a great deal of association between the Norse and a particularly savage kind of violence, and that's frequently overstated. In the context of the time they lived in, I don't think the violence committed by the Norse was any inherently worse than the violence committed by other medieval societies. 
I don't think you could quantify the effect of murder and arson and theft by the Norse as being any worse than the murder and arson and theft that occurred within Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and continental royal houses. It's fair to say that they're expansionist and that their method of expansion is ship-based and that their modus operandi is on the whole to cross the seas and raid foreign countries and take slaves and take plunder and then sail home with that. But they also tend to settle in areas that they frequently raid, so they don't remain these outsider pillagers. When they establish themselves, they form societies, and then we can pick out the really much more positive associations. The bold spirit of the Norse saw them dominate England and found settlements stretching from the Black Sea to North America. But this golden period was fleeting. By the middle of the 11th century, Christianity had supplanted the indigenous faith. The Valkyries flew no more. The Viking Age was ending. The two armies charged at one another, thrusting and slashing cutting and stabbing, so the enemies met. The Fomorians were led into battle by Colland himself. And there was only one man who dared face him. Colland towered over him, but Redside was a brave and skillful warrior. Back and forth, the two champions fought, metal ringing on metal, each waiting for the other to slip for a chance to end the battle with one fatal blow. Still eager, still strong, Colland charged. But it was a ruse. Redside dodged the mighty ogre's sword and lunged forward, his own blade flashing. The great ogre roared out in pain before collapsing to the ground with a mighty thud. Colland had fallen. No battle is without loss, and even victory cannot displace all the pain, grief, and anger. The scars of combat can run as deep in the mind as they do in the body. And the greatest stories of war know this. In the Anatolian expanses of modern Turkey, just south of the Dardanelles Strait, which divides Europe from Asia, there was once a place of legend, a mighty fortress overlooking the plains, a city of wealth and beauty. The remnants of its thick walls are now shrouded beneath the earth, its lavish temples and palaces crumbled to dust. But it was amid the rocks and rivers of this ancient plain that the greatest conflict in all myth took place, the Trojan War. It was a war sparked by the abduction of Queen Helen of Sparta by Prince Paris of Troy. An alliance of Greek kings then sailed to Troy with their armies to bring her back. A 10-year siege ensued. Only cunning ended the long stalemate. The Trojans were fooled into letting the Greeks beyond their gates. Troy was brutally sacked soon afterwards. Countless works of art have been inspired by the war. In its long duration and bloody aftermath, there are near infinite opportunities to explore the meaning and impact of conflict. The Trojan War offers an opportunity to look at a very wide range of human life. It offers the opportunity to look at the failure of guest friendship, what happens when those bounds of hospitality are broken, conflict in between two different regions, the coming together of the Greeks for a single purpose, all of these kinds of things the myth allows the Greeks to explore through one particular narrative. It doesn't just talk about war to glorify it. It also really offers an opportunity to look at the human cost, the people who suffer as
in the most literal possible way, not just for his city as a political entity, but for his family in its extraordinary vulnerability. You could read the epic as being about the unreasonableness of war, the pettiness of war, and therefore the human need to rise above that to try and remain human and humane within that struggle. Hector falls in combat at the hands of the Greek hero Achilles. It was his fate to die and for his city to eventually fall. But he carried on nonetheless, he fought to the end. His story still speaks to us, for death comes for all, but we all must carry on. It's about very fundamental aspects of human experience. Jealousy, anger, rage, struggle, love, hate. Um, all these things are really fundamental parts of, of the human experience. It is a city with many names. First, it was Byzantium. Later, it became Constantinople. But to many, it was just the city. And though we may not recognize it, that is how we know it to this day. For Istanbul is derived from the Greek words Aesten Polin, meaning to the city. That city was once the largest and wealthiest in Europe and a holy place of Christianity. In 1453, however, it fell to the invading forces of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was the superpower of its day, an expansionist and aggressive one at that. It was just assumed that nowhere Christian could really fall to Islam, it was just assumed that God would protect it. The idea that something so strong could collapse just dismayed and horrified them. According to the Christian understanding, God really shouldn't have allowed it to fall in the way it did. The conquest of the city shocked Europe. It would not be the end of the Ottomans' ambitions in the West, however. It expanded all the way into Eastern Europe. In fact, virtually all of what we now think of as the Balkans was either ruled directly by the Ottomans or was an Ottoman vassal. In this state of near constant war that followed, new stories and legends emerged. And just as men can make myths out of war, war can make myths out of men. Wallachia was a small principality in what is modern-day Romania. To the north stretched the Transylvanian Alps. To the south lay the mighty Danube River. This was the land that Prince Vlad Dracula called home. Between 1448 and 1476, he ruled Wallachia on three separate occasions. All these reigns were brief but his fame has become immortal nevertheless. He was the inspiration behind Bram Stoker's legendary vampire, Dracula. But Vlad was notorious long before the publication of Stoker's novel in 1897. In his own time, he was reviled as a sadist, whose taste for the cruelest of punishments led to his gruesome nickname, Vlad the Impaler. 
a German Meister singer, produced a poem that was actually sung in front of the then Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick III, which told of Vlad's crimes in detail. And one of the crimes that it emphasized was that he impaled his victims on stakes. There are stories of Vlad the Impaler eating his dinner while his enemies writhed around him, impaled on spikes. Later, this was elaborated even further, and there were some really grisly tales of mothers and infants being impaled together so that the infants were trying to clutch at the mothers and the mothers were trying to protect the infants, but they both died. Really gruesome stuff. But how fair was Vlad's reputation? Where's the truth amid the legend? And why did the tales spread and endure? Vlad lived at a time of upheaval. His lands were caught between the Christian powers to the west and the might of the Ottoman Empire to the east. In 1417, Wallachia had become a vassal state of the Ottomans. Vlad's father was the then ruler of the principality, but he was murdered in 1447 and his crown usurped. For decades afterwards, control of the region was contested again and again. As a grown man, Vlad fought to win back what he regarded as his birthright. At times, he allied himself with the Ottomans, and others, he joined the forces arrayed against them. But his reigns in Wallachia were short, unstable affairs. He was a man with many enemies. In 1462, having once again lost his crown, Vlad traveled to Transylvania to seek the help of the Hungarian king, Matthew Corvinus. Instead, the king had Vlad imprisoned. It was at this time that stories of Vlad's unique brutality began to spread. As soon as you have a war, hostilities of any kind, the atrocity stories begin. People really got off on exaggerating the evil Eastern European weirdness of this guy, and it just got more and more exaggerated and peculiar as the Western pressers churned it out. Even in his own lifetime, the man was becoming myth. And the stories of the cruelty and wickedness of Vlad Dracula did not disappear with his death in 1476. But legends are changeable things. Once a man becomes myth, he can be repackaged and repurposed again and again. In more recent years, there's been a reappraisal of Vlad III. He has become a perhaps unlikely hero. Romania was long dominated by foreign powers, it was subject to the Ottomans until the 19th century in the establishment of the Kingdom of Romania. But that was swept away after the Second World War, and Romania was once again in the shadow of a greater power, this time Soviet Russia. Like many post-communist countries, it's eager to go back to the time before communism and find heroes that predate those days. And Vlad is a perfect candidate. He was recast as a harsh yet just ruler who strengthened central government and fought for the nation at a time of conflict and unrest. In the schoolrooms of Romania, Vlad's story is still told. For defiance in the face of oppression will always appeal. The battle was over. The Nemedians celebrated. It was Fergus Redside who had triumphed, but few in his army had escaped the battle with the Fomorians unharmed. And as they tended to the wounded, a dread sound echoed across the island. It came from the sea. A fleet of ships cut through the waves towards them. It was another Fomorian army. More brother of the defeated Colland was already come for revenge. With a cry, Redside rallied his weary men. They charged the beach to fight once more. In the battle that followed, 
Not one fled from the other. Redside and Mork, Nemedian and Fomorian alike, they fell in mutual slaughter. The beach was stained crimson with their blood. Of the 30,000 Nemedians who had come to win their freedom, just 30 survived. This mournful band of the wounded and the weary seized a Fomorian ship. They sailed away far from Ireland and far away from the cruelty of the Fomorians. The defeat of the Nemedians in the Celtic Book of Invasions paves the way for the arrival of the Irish people themselves. The book made war a part of their origins, of their identity as a people, as it was for so many others. From the time of the Romans to that of the Norse, from the golden age of ancient Greece through to this very day, the character of individuals and of nations has been shaped by myths of war. They can tell us where we've come from and where we go after death. They tell us what makes us different from others and what we have in common. They tell us what we cherish, what we deplore, what we aspire to, and what we fear. They tell us who we are. The weapons of war have changed down the centuries. And though battles on the field may look different today, the battles within us remain much the same. Tales have been told since man first gathered around the fires of prehistory. Tales of the strange and wondrous things hidden in the vast unknown shadows of the world. Tales of creatures divine and beasts demonic, of gods and kings, of myths and monsters. From dark forests to the lands of ice, from desert wastes to the storm-thrashed seas, every corner of the earth has its legends to tell. Stories of heroes and the villains they encounter, of the wilderness and the dangers within. Stories of battles, of love, of order, and of chaos. But what are the roots of these fantastic tales? And why have they endured so long? In this series, we'll explore the history behind these legends and reveal the hidden influences that shaped them. War and disease, religious and social upheaval, the untamable ferocity of the natural world, and above all, the monsters lurking within ourselves. Love is patient, love is kind, love never fails. It is our most prized emotion. We pursue it, we treasure it, and we mourn its loss. But there is a darker side to love, for with desire comes jealousy, and with devotion, betrayal. Unleashed. Love can wreak violence, destruction, madness, and murder. It is in myth and legend that society wrestles with the twisting nature of love. How it can inspire us and devour us. How we try to explain it and whether we can ever control it.
love stories can tell us about the value placed on love, about the significance given to it, about how it was conceived. Well, love stories and myths are often about ways in which societies react, ways in which societies structure gender roles. What always strikes me about them is how few stories we would call love stories in the ancient tradition don't somehow rest on a power imbalance. They are really telling us about the fears, the aspirations, and often the dynamics in the society in which they're told. What it tells us is that we're not the rational human beings that we think we are, that we're also big squashy tubs of deep feeling that we can't altogether manage. Stories of love and betrayal in all its forms have provided the inspiration for some of our greatest works of literature and art, and we still return to them time and again. They tell us love can be great, but that it can also be dangerous. The royal convoy jolted over dirt roads. The journey had been a long one. Not a breeze disturbed the furnace heat of the day. Princess Iphigenia peered out at the countryside. Her mother, Queen Clytemnestra, dozed beside her. They had not stopped since that breathless messenger had first come to the palace. It was an urgent message from her husband, King Agamemnon. Clytemnestra was to join him at the distant port of Aulis, and she was to bring with her their beloved daughter, the beautiful Iphigenia. The carriage rumbled on. It would be hours before they reached their destination. Iphigenia examined an errant lock of hair. This would not do. She called the convoy to a halt and summoned her handmaidens. They shaped her hair into intricate braids. Jewels of gold were set about them. She wanted to look her best, for Iphigenia was on her way to get married. In modern society, most marriages, to start with at least, are based on love. But that was not always the case. In centuries past, Marriages, especially among the elite, were more often an alliance between families or nations. You did not marry for happiness. You married to fill a treasury, to avoid a war, or, as in the Norse tale of the Lay of Thrym, to reclaim something that was stolen. In the mythology of the Norsemen of Scandinavia, there was a land far beyond the realms of men and gods. It was a land bleak and beautiful, of towering forests and raging storms. It was the home of the giants. This was the unforgiving realm that Thor, the god of thunder, ventured to in search of his stolen hammer. Without that mighty weapon, he was unable to defend Asgard from its enemies. He had to reclaim it. The story of how he did is part of the poetic Edda, a fragmentary collection of old Norse poems. The poetic Edda was compiled in the 13th century, but the stories it contains are far more ancient. They're remnants of an oral tradition dating back centuries. The tale of Thor and his missing hammer is among the collection's most popular stories. The Thunder God soon realized where his hammer had gone. It had been stolen by Thrym, the hideous chief of the giants, and he would only return it on one condition. Freya, the goddess of love, had to marry him. Thor and his brother, the trickster god Loki, tried to convince her, but Freya refused. 
If Thor was to get his hammer back, he would have to find another way. His fellow gods had a suggestion. Thor himself should be Thrym's bride. The Thunder God was unimpressed with the idea of disguising himself as a woman. But he had no choice. The Lay of Thrym gives people a chance to kind of play the what-if game. If this were possible, what would happen? So very rarely in these love stories do you get a picture of what society is like. You get a picture either of what society could be like or what some of the pitfalls and important dynamics of marriages and love affairs are within the society itself. There's a lot of wacky gender bending in and around the Norse way of thinking, and it doesn't seem like that was because they were comfortable with gender bending. It actually seems like the opposite. But you can certainly see how important marriage was. Marriages were alliances. They were not love marriages whatsoever. And you can see this because the giants will sort of say, well, we have this or we will do this, but only if you give us Freya in marriage. With his brother Loki beside him, dressed as a bridesmaid, Thor went to the land of the giants for the wedding feast. As part of the ceremony, the hammer was placed in his lap. His chance had finally come. He seized his weapon and threw off his disguise. The giants scattered, but there was no escape from the Thunder God. Thor struck down first his stunned husband-to-be Thrym, and then all the other giants as well. Victorious, he returned to Asgard, his hammer and his masculinity restored at last. The tales of the Norse gods were often grotesque, but they represent a kind of funhouse mirror to Viking culture, distorted though they may be. Something of the true form can still be seen. In a way, Thor's disguise reflects the position women held in Norse society. The macho god was silenced as he donned the bridal robes. He remained quiet throughout the deception. His deep voice, of course, would have given him away, but his silence is revealing. To become a Norse woman in public, Thor had to lose his voice. The structure of Norse society was undoubtedly a patriarchal one. But that did not mean women were without power. The thing with patriarchal societies is that you're actually talking about the structure of society. In practice, things were often very different. Just in pragmatic terms, the women are very important. They would, in effect, be much more equal in terms of what was going on. Norse society consisted of two kinds of activity. You have the Vikings when they're off in their war bands doing raids. And then you have, if you will, the Vikings at home. The Vikings at home, you have a strikingly different picture. It's almost matriarchal. The women in Iceland and in the Norselands are very powerful and they are strongly in control of what goes on within their kinship network. Norse women did not become chieftains nor accompany men on their foreign raids. They forged their own roles instead. Less visible, perhaps, but influential all the same. The story of the Lay of Thrym reminds us that silent and meek, though they may have appeared, Norse women could be powerful too. The port of Aulis. Here, King Agamemnon had gathered his vast army, and here they waited, for there was no sign of the wind needed to carry them to war. In a tent perched high above the placid seas, Princess Iphigenia waited with her mother. She had never looked more beautiful, but then she had never met her future husband before. In the greatest army ever assembled, he was the greatest warrior, Achilles. This was the man Iphigenia had come so far to meet. This was the man her father had promised her. Achilles noticed Iphigenia staring at him and smiled. He looked every inch the son of a goddess. 
Iphigenia bowed. What is it that brings you to Aulis? the warrior said. He did not know of any wedding. Agamemnon had lied. He had lied to his wife. He had lied to his daughter. Tears pricked her eyes, but she would not let them see. She ran from the room, pushing past the guards. If it was not Achilles, then who was she there to marry? Iphigenia's disappointment is understandable. Rejection and dashed expectations are the price often demanded by love. But in mythology, even those who do marry may not find happiness. Cornwall in southwest England, an ancient coastline carved by the long ravages of sea and wind. This is a land of cove and beach, cliff and valley, a land with its own culture, its own language, and its own legends to tell. The story of Tristan and Isolde dates back to the 12th century. It tells of a love triangle between a handsome young knight, a beautiful Irish princess, and her husband, the King of Cornwall. The match between Isolde and King Mark was intended to bring peace between long warring kingdoms. Tristan was Mark's nephew and favorite knight. He was the one entrusted with bringing Isolde to Cornwall from Ireland. On that journey, however, Tristan and Isolde drank a potion which made them fall madly in love. The significance of the love potion varies a bit depending on which author is talking about it. But it is often administered to Tristan and Isolde without either of them knowing what's going on. The potion just represents overmastering desire. That moment where you just throw caution to the winds and even though you know you shouldn't, you're longing to do it so much that you just do it anyway. It absolves them from morality in the sense that it allows the authors in this story to kind of look at other things. What is the nature of a knight who is very loyal to the king and indeed the nephew of the king in many of these stories? What happens when that person becomes totally involved in this kind of emotion? Isolde did go on to marry Tristan's uncle, King Mark. Peace between Ireland and Cornwall demanded it. But the potion had not worn off. The affair with Tristan continued. All three characters loved one another. Tristan desired Isolde but respected his uncle. The king loved Tristan as a son and Isolde as a wife. She was grateful for his kindness but could not resist her lover. All three were plagued by terrible dreams of the future. These would prove prophetic. For eventually, King Mark did discover the affair. He plotted to kill the treacherous young couple. Tristan and Isolde managed to escape death, fleeing into the wild. But they found no happiness there either. They were still consumed with guilt. Their story was inspired by earlier Celtic tales. It, in turn, would shape later romances. Its influence can be seen in the tale of Lancelot and Guinevere. The first known account of the tragic love affair between King Arthur's wife and his greatest knight dates from the 12th century. It was written by Chrétien de Troyes, a French court poet. Chrétien de Troyes is one of the most famous of the medieval um, romance writers. He pretty well invented Arthurian romance. The most famous story is Lancelot and Guinevere. Chrétien introduces Lancelot into the Arthurian legend. Lancelot is a latecomer, really, to the round table, and he comes from a much more courtly era than those earlier sort of wilder, hairier knights. 
He's much more polished. He not only has great physical prowess, but also really knows his way around a banquet hall, is good with fashion, is physically beautiful, rather than just being big and burly and strong. That's what Chrétien brings into the story. By the time Chrétien was writing in the 12th century, the notion of courtly love was becoming very popular. And what this meant is that the warrior knight would be civilized through the love of a lady. The idea was that if you loved this unattainable woman, it would spur you on to do greater and greater deeds. The story was an appealing one for the women of the French court. In their everyday lives, the dynastic and political triumphed over the romantic. Arranged marriages were the norm. Husbands would disappear for years at a time on pilgrimage or crusade, while they were free to have mistresses. For women, the bonds of marriage were unbreakable. One of the key things to understand is that many of the most powerful patrons to which these writers of the 11th and 12th centuries are trying to appeal are women. If you're trying to appeal to these highly educated, very sophisticated French-speaking women, you're obviously going to want to tell them stories about other very highly educated, very sophisticated women and their interesting love lives. At this period, you get another thing which is very interesting, which is the beginning of proper feminist literature. You have female writers sort of saying, look, women are not just Eve figures who introduced sex into the world. They're not just bargaining chips in marriage. They have a psychology of their own. They have morality. They have something to contribute. The aristocratic women, at least, were beginning to be able to articulate their place in society, their own psychology, their own identity. More was at stake in these stories than hurt feelings alone. Tristan and Isolde's affair endangered the truce between Cornwall and Ireland. Peace was only assured when the couple decided to separate. Isolde returned to King Mark, and Tristan left Cornwall forever. In these stories, the fate of nations rests on affairs of the heart. They remind us that behind great moments of history often lie human relationships and human failings. They explore how all of us must reconcile private passions with other responsibilities, and they ask, when our loyalties, our loves compete, which will triumph and what will the consequences be? The miserable Iphigenia was dressed in her wedding finery. Her mother led her towards the altar. Her father, Agamemnon, waited there. All the other kings of Greece stood with him. But which of the old men was to be Iphigenia's husband? We are all of us but mortal, the king's voice trembled. We cannot defy the gods. Iphigenia was blindfolded, for Agamemnon had displeased the goddess Artemis. She was the one who had stilled the winds. A terrible sacrifice was demanded if ever the Greeks were to reach Troy. Clytemnestra surged forward, trying to reach her daughter, but strong arms held her back. She cried out, begging her husband not to harm their child. But Agamemnon drowned out her words with prayer. Clytemnestra screamed as her daughter slumped to the ground. Then it began, quietly at first, but soon spreading from harbor end to harbor end, the ropes and rigging of a thousand ships, limped so long, bucked against their stays. The wind was blowing again. With the death of Iphigenia, Agamemnon's fleet was free to depart for Troy. The war there would last for 10 long years. When victory finally came, the sack of the city was a bloody one. But some Trojans did survive. Among them was a prince called Aeneas, 
Although his wife died in the carnage, he managed to escape the burning city with his aged father and infant son. His story is told in the great epic poem, The Aeneid. It was written over a period of 10 years in the first century BC by the Roman poet Virgil. It is widely regarded as his masterpiece. As Aeneas' fleet sailed across the Mediterranean, it was beset by a devastating storm. Aeneas and his men were forced onto the shores of Africa. Its plains were veiled with cork oak and olive trees. Its hills, charred by the sun, seemed to lope eagerly towards the shade of distant mountains. It was on this harsh and arid coast that the city of Carthage was to be found. Aeneas and his men might have expected a hostile welcome. Instead, the Carthaginians and their queen, Dido, took pity. For Carthage was a new settlement founded by refugees, just like the Trojans. In Aeneas, Dido saw a mirror of herself. She too had lost a spouse to violence. She too had been forced to flee her home. Dido is a very competent, very capable leader. Virgil says, Femina dux facti, woman was the leader of the action. She's very positively presented as a leader. Venus enchants Dido into falling in love with Aeneas to ensure that he gets a warm welcome and the supplies he needs. So it's kind of a mean trick. You know, poor Dido is just innocently extending sacred hospitality to a stranger, and Venus sort of creeps up behind her and fills her heart with passion. Dido offered the Trojans not simply a place to recover after a storm, but a home as well. Cloaked in her kindness, however, was an act of hostility. Aeneas faced many foes on his journey to Italy, but love was to prove the most dangerous. When Dido and Aeneas go off on a hunting party, the goddesses arrange a great big storm that is so bad that they have to take shelter, separated from the rest of the party in a cave. And they consummate their relationship to the sound of wolves howling, which is not really a very good omen. Dido represented a threat, not just to the onward progression of the story, but to the future of the world itself. For Carthage offered a viable alternative for Aeneas. Merging their families and people, he could have ruled the prosperous city by Dido's side. He could have been happy there. If he chose to stay, however, his people would never reach Italy. They would never found Rome. The history of the world, the Aeneid tells us, hinged on this moment. What happens in the poem is that the god Mercury is sent to shake up Aeneas, to wake him up, remind him he's got a destiny he's meant to be fulfilling. So he comes down and he says to Aeneas, what are you doing? You're standing around on the walls of Carthage. You've got your own place to go and found. When Dido hears that he is going to leave, she confronts him and accuses him of planning to leave secretly. And he tells her that he's being torn by duty. He's not going of his own choice. This isn't his, his own free will. He's being forced to do this by the gods. Dido was heartbroken. Aeneas had abandoned her for a future even he struggled to believe in. She was overcome with anguish. As Aeneas sailed away, she built a pyre in the center of her palace, climbed on top, and plunged a sword through her heart. Sadly, I think that Aeneas leaving Dido is meant to be the key Roman moment in the entire epic. I think it's meant to imply the Roman male's ability to renounce sensuous pleasure, and the appeal of everything that Carthage represents, which is kind of seductive, bad religion, naughty, immoral practices in favor of the straight, linear Roman legion ideal. It's also a triumph over sort of luxury and Orientalism and comfort. One of the things that Mercury criticizes Aeneas IV is wearing sort of a rich purple robe that Dido has given him. 
I think it's meant to be a moment for drum beating and the sound of trumpets. The fact that it's also imbued with pathos is because Virgil's writing it, and Virgil really never writes anything without imbuing it with pathos. That's his thing. So he portrays Dido as this helpless, tragic victim, but it's not meant to make us think that Aeneas made the wrong choice. From his ship, Aeneas saw the burning pyre and the walls of the palace aglow with its flames. He knew what it meant. Once again, he was leaving behind a city shrouded in smoke, torn apart by outsiders. However, this time, he was responsible. Dido would haunt him throughout the rest of the Aeneid. Her city, Carthage, would trouble Rome for centuries. In Dido's dying words, she says she is rejoicing to travel to the underworld and she hopes that Aeneas will see the pyre and that her death will be an omen, an omina for the Romans. Now, what this foreshadows is several centuries of conflict in between Rome and Carthage. Roman Carthage had, by Virgil's time, fought three very vicious wars called the Punic Wars. And Virgil is almost saying it's intrinsic to Rome to be opposed to Carthage because of this choice that Aeneas made. Virgil lays bare love's destructive potential. It tempted Aeneas to forget his duty, and it transformed Dido from a wise, strong leader into a humiliated, savage creature. But there is a second transformation at work one subtler and perhaps more subversive. Virgil was writing in the aftermath of a civil war. The assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC had led to a power vacuum at the heart of the Roman Republic. The struggle for supremacy would last more than a decade. In the end, it was Octavian, adopted son of Caesar, who triumphed. At the Battle of Actium, he defeated his one-time ally, Mark Antony. At Mark Antony's side to the end was his lover, Cleopatra, the Queen of Egypt. She was a figure of mockery, fear, and hatred in Rome. Virgil knew all this, so it is impossible to ignore the echoes of the African queen in his portrayal of Dido. It would have resonated, particularly with Virgil's audience, which would have just lived through the Second Triumvirate Wars, which did very much involve the Antony Cleopatra Egyptian alliance. There's very much a way that we can read the Dido Aeneas episode as Aeneas teetering on an Antony Cleopatra precipice, narrowly escaping the fate. Cleopatra was seductive in some of the same ways as Dido. She's sort of oriental. That in itself is seductive. She comes from what can be understood as a foreign religion, a foreign culture. She's kind of magical in some of the same ways as Dido. So I think in all those respects, the figure of Dido could have been read by Virgil's original audiences as a kind of avatar of Cleopatra. You might expect Dido, an enemy twice over, representing both Cleopatra and Carthage, to be vilified. Yet Virgil does not ask readers to hate her. Instead, he transforms her into the poem's most compelling character. He makes his audience feel Dido's rejection and the terrible pain she suffers. He makes us sympathize with the enemy. Love. Virgil tells us can be a dangerous thing, but if it is, then it is one shared across divides of politics and nationhood. The eastern shores of the Black Sea, in the shadow of the Caucasus Mountains, this was the edge of the ancient Greek world. There was once a kingdom here, rich in iron and gold. Colchis was its name. This was the land which the Greek hero Jason came to on his quest for the Golden Fleece. An exiled prince, Jason needed the fleece to prove his worth and reclaim the throne that had been taken from him. But the fleece belonged to another man, King Aetes, 
and he guarded it jealously. If Jason wanted the fleece, the king told him, he would have to complete several challenges. Each seemed impossible and would have been, but for the help of a young woman who had fallen deeply in love with the Greek hero, the daughter of King Aetes himself, Medea. Medea is perhaps one of the most fascinating characters in the whole of classical mythology. She is generally regarded and described in the texts of all periods as a witch, that is, she's someone who has huge magical power. When we first meet Medea, she's very much a traditional lovesick maiden, brimming with unrequited love and very modest and very nervous. But even at this stage, we start to see sort of a much darker, much more powerful figure uh, starting to emerge. With Medea's help, Jason completed the king's challenges. First, he had to harness fire-breathing bulls, then use them to plow a field. He had to sow serpents' teeth in the earth and kill the soldiers who miraculously grew from them. Finally, he had to overcome a sleepless dragon guarding the fleece itself. Such was her love for Jason that when the Greek hero left Colchis in triumph, Medea went with him. She would go on to bear his sons and travel by his side throughout the Greek world. Having already stretched the mold of the helper maiden, Medea would challenge the constraints of her future roles as wife and mother too. Any happiness Jason and Medea had would not last. When they reached Corinth, Jason abandoned Medea for the daughter of the king there. But it was what she did next that secured her name in history. She destroyed the things dearest to her husband their children. Medea then fled Corinth and Jason for Athens. It was in that city that the story as we know it best today was written. Its author was the great playwright Euripides. Euripides was the first one really to create characters who had a psychological reality. And that probably makes him more interesting to modern theater goers than perhaps some of the others. He also has a very light-hearted touch in that there is a surprising amount of black humor in Euripides. He really goes for that kind of dark irony and that bitterness that still somehow manages to be funny. He's kind of free to create this wonderful, wonderful, not a moral character, but this character who's driven internally by her own idea of what ought to happen. Euripides forces the audience into uncomfortable questions. As Medea veers from behavior we deem good to behavior we deem evil, we ask what it takes to go from one to the other. What drives humans to inhuman acts? And what might we be capable of in the wrong circumstances. It's pretty terrifying because it's two passions opposing one another. The passion to get your own back at someone you loved and trusted who's betrayed you in the worst possible way, completely unfeelingly and unthinkingly, versus the maternal passion for your children, you know, the longing to look after them and shelter them and nurture them and make sure no harm comes to them. The Greeks were not necessarily keen on intense emotions. They felt that restraint was rather more important. So it would have seemed to them almost natural that this woman who was an outsider and a witch and obsessively in love should have fallen in on herself like this. So I think it's not a particularly positive attitude to the emotion of love. Euripides' play was first performed in 413 BC. Every year, Athens held a festival dedicated to the god Dionysus. New plays were performed and judged. It was at this festival that Euripides presented his version of the Medea story. He came last. We don't know what the audience reaction was, but there are several things that could have made an audience uneasy or, or less than happy about it. 
One can assume that this would have been a very challenging play for them at the time, just as it remains a very challenging play for us. I mean, one cannot not be attracted to Medea, but then you stand back and you think, well, what has this woman done? So in a sense, she is attacking all of the institutions of kingship and marriage that were very central to the Greeks. She's destroying their sense of order, and order was really important in the Greek world. Euripides' telling of the story has inspired writers and artists from every generation. And today, his tragedy is perhaps the most popular of all ancient Greek plays. It's the complexity of the lead character that drives this endless reinterpretation. Medea acts on emotion, but is also cunning. She's the wife of a Greek hero, but a foreign barbarian at the same time. She's a loving wife who defies her husband, a loving mother who murders her children. She's a woman who rejects the roles that male-dominated society has given her, even as she embodies them. Medea's story tells us something very profound about ancient Greek attitudes to women, and particularly to the idea that women can't control their emotions as well as men can. The Medea highlights the double standard. It's perfectly acceptable for Jason to decide he's going to abandon the woman who has left her country for him, had his children, go off and remarry sort of a young Corinthian princess, and Medea is supposed to just say, that's fine, dear, that's OK. By living through her passions, as the play forces us to do, we're encouraged to think, in that situation, how could I restrain myself? While this is obviously a very extreme case, it also establishes the idea of love as this dangerous driving force that can cause problems if it is not paid attention to. After 10 years of war, the triumphant Agamemnon returned home from Troy. But his wife, Clytemnestra, had sworn an oath all those years ago. The daughter Agamemnon had sacrificed to reach Troy had not been forgotten. At last, there would be justice for Iphigenia. Love and violence seem bound together in Greek mythology. Just as in the tales of other cultures, it recognizes there are many sides to love. All these stories still speak to us, for the nature of this most powerful of emotions has not changed. The reason that myths of love endure is that they tell us about human desires, and they tell us how perverse human desire is. It's interesting that very often they aren't about love in the sense that we would recognize it. So they're not really like the romantic novels we're used to. Human desire is typically not something under much rational control, and in myths it often runs away with even the wariest and smartest heroes and queens and lures them into places where they'd really rather not be. You have that question of where do you put love as this irrational, driving, powerful emotion within a structure of society and what happens when it is scorned. All societies must find a way of channeling this emotion, for its power over the human spirit is unrivaled. If at times it does inspire acts of horrifying violence, it is far more often responsible for kindness, self-sacrifice and bravery. We cannot, however, have one without the other. Love is patient, love is kind, but love is also irrational, and love can be dangerous. Yeah.